Okay. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Excellent. Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mason Cavell. I'm a project manager with Community Roots Housing. And Stephen, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, and I'm Stephen Nip, and I'm the executive director here at Gen Fried. It's good to see a lot of development types on the call, but also some senior folks. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're excited to talk about the project. It's been obviously a, a big part of our lives, respectively, for a long time. And Stephen and I have forged a pretty close relationship through thick and thin over the last few years. So um, always a privilege to share our experiences from the project. Um, so we will launch right in. Um, so we wanted to just kind of set the table here and talk a little bit about how the project came to be and why. Um, and actually, I also just want to note, I've had a chest cold all weekend and I have a bit of a cough, so please bear with me. I have some pre-unwrapped cough drops over here, um, but I'm going to try not to be too annoying. Um, anyhow, um, so you know, there was some research done by a UW professor, Dr. Karen Fredrickson Goldson. We'll hear more about her later. Um, but she had done some research published in 2016 about um, essentially disparities in health outcomes and housing conditions for LGBTQ seniors in Seattle. And that really bubbled up through kind of a variety of community networks, advocacy groups, and political types. Um, and Community Roots was approached, Capitol Hill Housing at the time, approached about the concept of, of exploring Washington's first LGBTQ senior affordable housing project. Um, so we put together an advisory committee represented by a, a variety of groups um, that serve either the senior or the LGBTQ population um, to really think about, okay, what does this project look like? What, what are the objectives? Who are we trying to serve and how can we do this? Um, so we put this group together um, right around the same time Gen Pride was actually forming, and Stephen will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but um, you know, throughout 2016 and 2017, um, it was determined that Gen Pride would partner with Community Roots to be the service provider, um, and then also just kind of a project partner. There's a variety of roles that they serve on the project that we'll talk about a little bit more later. And we also hired Environmental Works as the architect to start with the early stage concept design, and they're, they're still the project architect today. Um, we then, um, through a pretty unique um, acquisition arrangement with Sound Transit in Seattle Central College, it involved a land swap. Um, we were able to obtain site control for a piece of land on Broadway between Pike and Pine. So we're talking the dead center of Capitol Hill. Um, kind of the most exciting block, if you will. So it's a great location for us to be able to site Washington's first LGBTQ affirming affordable housing project. Um, once, we, once we had site control there, we knew that that was the right site for this particular project and this population. Um, we launched into some pretty robust community engagement throughout 2018 and 2019, um, not only meeting with our advisory committee, you know, comprised of professionals and, you know, executive directors of groups that serve the population, but also the public at large. And then also some groups that had, had banded specifically to advocate for senior LGBTQ affordable housing. So Stephen and I were going and meeting with groups, you know, kind of all over the place, um, getting kind of taking our marching orders and trying to understand what we could do here to really hit the target on behalf of the population. Um, and then, uh, you know, in 2019, um, we put together our funding applications for our, our public subsidies um, and we got our awards. So on the housing side, we were awarded funds from Seattle Office of Housing, King County and the State Housing Trust Fund. Um, and then for Gen Pride specifically, um, uh, they were awarded some direct appropriations from the state as well as some other capital campaign funds and we were off and running. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephen now just to talk a little bit more about the importance of LGBTQ senior housing and, and why, why we're doing it. So thanks, Mason. Um, 
So essentially, Karen Fredrickson Goldson, who was mentioned earlier, she is a UW professor in the School of Social Work. Uh, she, uh, back in early 2000, began a, a 10 year longitudinal study of LGBTQ seniors all across the country. So this is in all nine census divisions. People were, were surveyed and followed over the course of about 10 or 15 years. In fact, they're still being followed. Uh, the basic uh, premise of that survey and question was, you know, how do LGBTQ elders uh, age differently than the general population? So she was trying to collect a lot of data about LGBTQ elders, their lives, their history, their experience, uh, and then their current experience as seniors and how, do, how they can, uh, how they were accessing services. And some of the things they found, of course, were very similar to the general population in terms of aging, things like isolation, uh, income uh, issues and things like that. Um, but what was surprising was that uh, her study also found that people were, you know, going into assisted living facilities, uh, maybe their partner died, they were going into these facilities, and they really weren't feeling, they weren't feeling the vibe there, they weren't feeling especially welcomed, uh, and a lot of folks were forced to kind of come out of the closet or stay in the closet, rather, uh, if they came out of the closet, it often had consequences for their care and their surrounding people that lived in the housing units with them. Uh, and if they stayed in the closet, it caused additional kind of stress and health disparities began to kind of spiral out of control around, around that kind of a scenario. So the, the, the study was really to get a sense of just how, uh, how a nonprofit organization could, could meet some of those, some of those um, challenges that were discovered in the survey. Uh, there were a number of different recommendations. Um, one was to begin an LGBTQ-focused senior center. Uh, for those of you in the senior services, you know that senior centers are kind of a standard um, uh, a model around the country where it's a place to gather, um, not only for recreational and social activities, but more importantly, to access senior services. Uh, and LGBTQ folks were not accessing those services in the numbers that were in the general population, like only 15% of folks were getting access to services for the same reasons they were not feeling it at assisted living facilities. They'd go into these senior centers and they would feel a little out of place. It wouldn't, didn't really see anyone like them in the centers. So the first thing that Gen Pride did once it was formed in 2000, it was actually uh, formed in late 2015, began operations in 2016, was to go out and to train facilities to become more welcoming and inclusive. How do you do that? Learn a little bit more about the community, some of their stressors, their history, why they were showing up in these facilities and not identifying themselves because a lot of them had histories of discrimination, trauma, and that sort of thing. So it just kind of, it kind of kept these folks on the margins. And so our training team uh, went out and we probably uh, uh, trained a couple thousand people in King County at different centers and different uh, area senior uh, service organizations to bring them up to speed on the cultural competency, if you will, of, of our community. Uh, that was the first couple of years. These are trainings that are still a big part of Gen Pride's uh, mission. Uh, we still do uh, uh, trainings to you know, anyone in the county. We get a grant from the county so we can uh, do these uh, services uh, pro bono or for, to the agencies. Um, and we also uh, go into senior centers now throughout King County to make sure that the folks that aren't able to come into Capitol Hill perhaps and access Gen Pride, they would have some other access to the senior centers that may be closer to their homes. So essentially, um, right now uh, in 2018, as Mason, Mason mentioned, um, that was actually when I joined Gen Pride, it was in 2018, and voila, we had a building and, and, uh, and a big ass project to really <laughs> put together. So, so Mason and I have been kind of, you know, working real closely over the last uh, couple of years to um, not only build a building and get, get the funding required and get community input, but now Gen Pride is building uh, a, a 4,400 square foot senior center on the ground floor of the building. And I can go into a little bit more about that information um, in the next slide, which I believe I've discussed already. This is the Gen Pride origins. So Karen Fredson Goldson, who's a lesbian, uh, she and her wife founded Gen Pride back in 2016 through a community advised approach. She went out to the different community members, uh, seniors that were providing services to the to elders. And, you know, just really kind of figured out how, what do we need? How do we do it? What's the plan? So they formed this, this nonprofit organization back in 2015. And like I mentioned, we began doing our work in 2016. So uh, next slide. Um, 
so this this is just kind of a a, a, a our, our kind of mantra around why we're building this place. You know, we want seniors to feel empowered. We want them to have a place to stay young in spirit, even as they age, uh, to stay in the neighborhood that they've long, that they've, that they've loved all their lives and have friends and services nearby, you know, and to find connection in a period of life when isolation takes a toll, you know, to discover new hobbies and to be feeling like they're accepted where they're, where they are and to create a new family structure. Because one of the reasons why LGBTQ seniors were, were suffering more so than the general population was these biological connections that weren't happening there. So the people were having to kind of form their own families. We call them families of origins in our community. And these are folks that we just begin to kind of uh, become friendly with and try to build lives with. So the next slide, um, I think this is your up here, Mason. Yeah, back to me. And, mm -hmm. and we'll get a little bit more into the Gen Pride Center and the services provided there later in the presentation. Um, but I know there's developers in the room. Um, so I wanted to just run down a little bit about sort of the fundamentals of the, of the deal structure. Um, so this project is a pretty typical 4% bond deal. Again, we have subsidy from Office of Housing King County and HTF. So it was an exciting closing. Um, our average affordability is, is just a shred below 50% AMI. We do have um, some 30% units, some 60% units. Um, I believe that only one bedrooms are 60% um, and all of the studios are either 50% or, or 30%. Um, we are, I guess all units are technically set aside to residents 55 and older. Um, and then we're also, um, right now, actually, Stephen and I have been working on this for years, but we've, we've got the bit, bit in our teeth and we're, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to bring in either some project-based or, or tenant-based HOPA vouchers. Um, so we're working with a group called Lifelong right now to try to carve out some additional units for that specific population. Um, uh, I, one thing I should note that this is, this is conventional affordable housing. It's not permanent supportive housing. Um, and it's certainly not meant to be um, what we would call assisted living or anything along those lines, but we are providing, you know, through our partnership with Gen Pride, certainly more services, things like case management, et cetera, that are above and beyond what we would see in a typical um, conventional affordable housing project. Um, you know, I think one important point, um, you know, we call the project and we're, we're very careful with our with our language around it. We actually, we typically call it LGBTQ affirming senior housing. Um, because of fair housing, we are not able to restrict applicants based on sexual orientation. And so we will be using a robust affirmative marketing approach to try to shape the applicant pool such that we're, we're you know, attracting or giving LGBTQ seniors sort of the best opportunity to apply and sort of be first in line when we when we open the window for applications and we're working closely with Gen Pride on that um, getting the word out we've already been doing some workshops you know we maintain a list of people who have expressed interest in applying and we're just going to make sure that when we do start accepting applications in 2023 that the folks that are sort of intended to live in the building have every chance to be first in line um, in addition to the residential portion of the project we this was actually a condition of our acquisition agreement with Sound Transit, and it is technically considered a TOD development. Um, we have about 3,500 square feet of commercial retail right along the Broadway street frontage. And the idea there is that we're gonna try to, Community Roots Housing will own that retail condo, um, but we will work with Gen Pride and um, GSBA and some of our other partners in the hopes uh, is to bring um, LGBTQ owned and operated businesses into those spaces. Um, and then we have our 4,400 square foot Gem Pride Senior Community Center. Um, Steven's gonna walk in more through that later. Just, you know, sort of quick details. That is actually condoed out. Um, so that will be a condo that is owned by Gen Pride, which is very important. You know, we wanted to make sure that Gen Pride had the opportunity to own that space, control their destiny in what is often a volatile and rapidly changing real estate market. Um, it's an asset for Gem Pride to build on. And we are partnered. Um, uh, it's actually not only this project, but Community Roots Housing, Gen Pride, and a few other groups have banded together um, on a capital campaign called Rise Together, um, where we're bringing in uh, you know, foundations, private donors, 
um, grants, other forms of public subsidy. We have a couple state direct appropriations. Um, so we've sort of pieced together a hodgepodge of funding sources for the Gen Pride Cold Shell and then the TI build out. So um, where's the project? Like I mentioned, um, it is on Broadway between Pike and Pine. Um, so it's really right in the middle of everything. Um, and I can tell you that it's a very exciting place to build because of some of the public infrastructure that exists on Broadway right there. So um, I don't know if any of you can picture it, um, but imagine there is a, an in-ground streetcar. So the street trolley runs right up Broadway there. There is a protected bike lane. There are overhead electrified bus lines and they are very busy sidewalks um, in addition to a lot of vehicle traffic and some tricky turn lanes. Um, so it was a pretty exciting place um, and a lot of coordination required with SDOT in order to get our approvals to shut the street down, to bring in our deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. We were also required to install a 200 foot storm main uh, right down the middle of Broadway that tapped in at the intersection at Pike. Um, so we had essentially shut down Broadway for almost six full weeks in order to do this work. So um, a lot of fun conversations with SDOT around that. Um, and we're grateful to the Office of Housing for their support. <laughs> um, and here's just a picture of the site. Um, uh, some of you might be familiar with the old taco shop that was right there. Um, and then, so here's a, the taco shop. We actually also acquired what's called the, the old Atlas Clothing Building. And then this was a um, barber shop, hair salon with a parking lot behind. Um, interestingly enough, this building called the Eldridge Building is historically landmarked. So we were required to preserve this. Um, it's an homage to Seattle's auto row architecture. Um, it used to be a Texaco station. Um, so anyhow, we are actually required to preserve this. Um, so we're having to preserve, we call them the huts. So we're preserving the huts. We are preserving the Port Cochere, which is this kind of bridge roof that connects the two huts. And then our building is an L-shaped building that comes in behind it. Um, so um, just a couple site considerations. Um, that's obviously an important thing when we're thinking about a project that's appropriate for a specific population, the site is important. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of gentrification pressure in Capitol Hill. A lot of LGBTQ seniors have been pushed out um, so the opportunity to secure this site right in the middle of the neighborhood was wonderful. Um, so sort of culturally and historically, it's a very appropriate site for the project. Um, it is, you know, in the middle of the neighborhood as it relates to access to grocery stores. You know, there, there's a, you know, QFC, a Walgreens, a variety of other stores, shops, restaurants, healthcare centers, cultural spaces, parks, you name it, everything is within very close walking distance. Um, um, in addition to, you know, the streetcar, bus stops, we're close to the light rail station, um, protected bike lanes, um, it gets the highest possible walk score. Um, so thinking about a population where we we're not providing parking on site, we don't expect a lot of the residents to own vehicles. And so we are building this project in an area where they should be able to access virtually anything they're going to need um, within walking distance or by using the nearby transit. So that's very important. Sort of one thing that we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, mention this though, and this is something that came up a lot in our community engagement is the safety and security challenges on that block. You know, Capitol Hill as a whole, and that block really in particular, there is a lot of activity there. Um, and so there were a lot of concerns voiced about, about safety and security. Um, you know, we have done what we can do in the design phase to try to, you know, eliminate creating unsafe spaces. You know, we'll certainly be um, using lighting and cameras and what we can to try to keep residents safe. Um, but we think that this is gonna be an ongoing programming discussion around how, you know, as a community, we can, we can do things to try to ensure safety, you know, coordination with um, the police, other community groups, banding together. Um, residents have talked about forming safety committees, 
Um, and so this is something that we're going to work with Gen Pride on very closely. Um, we wanna be receptive to hearing what residents say once we're actually placed in service and operational. And Community Roots is prepared to respond as needed. If it, if it comes to it, you know, we'll think about getting some sort of third-party security as needed. Um, but we also see that block changing quite a bit. We have another project um, starting across the street um, right after this one. Um, and we're hopeful that, you know, sort of over time, the neighborhood becomes a little bit inherently more safe. But it's something we're mindful of. Okay, so here's the building. Um, so this was, again, um, designed by Environmental Works. Um, we went through many iterations of sort of public survey on this um, uh, in order to come up with the color scheme, the overall facade design, the modulation and articulation, et cetera. And there seemed to be a pretty solid consensus around this motif where we have some protruded window boxes that are that sort of represent different colors of the rainbow flag um, at sort of random intervals. So that's sort of our signature design feature. Um, you know, I know the, the Eldridge huts here are a little bit muddled, but we will be restoring them as close to original condition as possible. We'll be using the old clay tile roof. For those of you who remember that that building used to have a clay tile roof. Um, and then we'll be restoring um, what was the Atlas building facade. We did demolish this, the Atlas building, um, but we're rebuilding the facade to try to sort of capture the essence of what it did look like. Um, and then, you know, our building is set back about seven feet from the facade of, of the Atlas building. Um, the main entrance to the building um, will be down under the Port Cochere. Um, it's recessed um, and it's probably about three feet down from the sidewalk level. So there are stairs and a ramp. Um, there's bioretention planters that line each side of that entrance. And on either side in, and I'll show you a, a floor plan in a moment, but on, as, you're, as you're entering the door on the left side, there is a furnished lobby and the site manager office with a clear line of sight to the entrance. And then on the right side is the Gen Pride community meeting room. And there's actually an overhead garage door that pulls up. So the idea is in the nice months, that'll be very, very open and, and welcoming. Um, so, so here is our ground level plan. So I'll just try to kind of quickly walk you through it. So we have the two Eldridge huts. Um, this one will just be a commercial retail, maybe a coffee shop, maybe a hair salon, TBD. Um, this hut is actually gonna be included in the Gen Pride condominium and they'll be providing healthcare services in this space. Um, we've built it out as a little micro clinic. Um, Stephen will tell you more about that later. Um, the, all this area back here in the hatched area, this is the Gen Pride tenant improvement space. And again, Stephen will walk you through that in more detail in a few minutes. Um, up here, this is our roughly 3,500 square feet of uh, commercial retail. Um, and right now it's, it's fluid. Um, we expect that it will be broken up into at least two different bays. Um, but right now we're, we're still working on who might actually lease that space and what their needs are going to be. So it, it's still TBD. We have installed um, sort of the basic infrastructure to facilitate a restaurant. So we're bringing in um, cooking gas. We have the appropriate hoods and chases and whatnot, um, such that if it is a restaurant, we're, we're ready to meet that, that need. Um, and then we have our common back of house and trash, et cetera. So as I was mentioning earlier, you know, this is the main entrance. So residents will come off of Broadway and you'll either take the ramp or the stair and you'll enter the building right here. And right here, you have your opportunity to either enter into the Gen Pride space or to go into the residential condominium. Here we have a furnished lobby. This is actually not something that we typically do at Community Roots. Um, we don't typically create sort of a, an area for people to congregate in the lobby, but we thought that was important for this population. Um, so we'll have, you know, a couple couches, tables, chairs. It's meant to be a place where people can hang out, wait for their friends, um, do whatever. And then the building manager's office is right here. We also have our mailboxes here. Um, very close to the centrally located elevator bank and active stair. So we're you know, hoping to promote people using the stair here as much as possible. 
Um, and then we have, we do have a gurney sized elevator, um, one stretcher sized, one gurney sized. Um, again, that's another accommodation made sort of specifically for the senior population. Typically we would just do two of the stretcher size elevators, but we're, we're going with the gurney here just in case. Um, one thing I'd like to note, um, we do not do trash chutes and this building sort of did not trigger the threshold for trash chutes. Um, so we do ask our residents to bring their, their trash recycle and compost down into a common trash room. Um, but what we did do is we located that directly adjacent to our elevator bank. So the idea is you can bring your trash and recycle. This is an automatic door, so you can hit the, pa the little paddle this door automatically opens up and brings you out onto a landing where you'll be able to drop your trash recycling compost over a ledge. The idea being uh, you don't have to lift a bag up to, you know, over your head or sort of up to chest height in order to get your trash up and into the dumpster. You can just drop it over the edge and we will have guardrails to make sure nobody falls in. Um, one thing we have also discussed in terms of resident programming is you know if there are residents that have difficulty um, getting their trash or recycled down to that room, there are things that we can try to do as a reasonable accommodation, either with building staff or through some sort of um, sort of neighbor community program to try to help people get their trash down there. So, um, moving down. Um, so I just wanted to show sort of a typical floor plan. This is this is the second floor plan. Um, what you'll see on this floor, um, you know, we do have a combination of, of studios and one bedrooms only. Um, that is another aberration from a typical community roots project. We typically see a broader mix of studios, ones, twos, and three bedrooms. Because of the population, we decided to keep the, the unit mix pretty narrow. So we have 90 studios and we have 28 one bedrooms. Um, uh, on the second level here, sort of the, the only difference between this level and floors three through eight, it's a six over two, it's an eight-story building, um, is that on this level, we actually have a resident-specific community room. So in this room, we'll have, you know, couches, tables, chairs, computers, TV, you know, pretty standard places for people to hang out. Um, we did do a second bathroom related to this common area. Typically, we'd only do one, but we wanted to do two bathrooms. Um, given the population. And then this community room actually opens up out onto an outdoor patio space where we will be providing some, um, some planters that residents can use to garden, plant herbs and some vegetables and flowers and stuff like that. That, that was something that was requested um, as a common theme in our community engagement. So we're, we're happy to be able to deliver on that. There will be a barbecue, plenty of benches, that kind of stuff. Um, Anyhow, um, so you know, one thing that you, it's impossible to get away from, these units are very small. Um, they're very tight units. Um, it's a mix of, of C dues and E dues. Um, uh, so most of them have a full bath. Some of them just have a stand up shower stall. And this is actually something interestingly that we, we consulted the community on this. And we, we, we asked, we said, look, you know, we're, we're mindful of the fact that these the units as as drawn are pretty small, the question that we have is what's more important, you know, delivering a larger unit for the people that do live here, or delivering more units to meet the community need. And it seemed that that the community said we need more units to meet community need. Um, and so that's that's where we landed. We also have financing realities. We have to make the thing pencil. And so, you know, we were in a bit of a tug of war with our public funders over the number of units. Believe it or not, this building actually at one point had 125 units, um, and we we shrunk it down to 118 because we thought it was getting um, unreasonably tight. Um, but anyhow, um, they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, one major thing that we've done here, um, as it relates to the senior population, code requires us to have five percent of units as Type A units. You know, with the remainder being Type B units. One thing that we decided early on is that we were going to exceed that. So we actually have 14 type A units. So we have one full stack of studios and one full stack of one bedrooms as type A units. Um, so we're, we're proud of being, being able to do that and provide those additional type A units. Um, 
I'll get into to some other kind of accommodations we've made more later. Um, but otherwise, they're they're pretty straightforward. Um, trying to borrow some of the Walsh construction CEDC techniques here, um, a little bit maybe a little bit early for that. I think if we designed this building a year later, we would have been adopting some more of those techniques. Um, but no frills. Um, they're they're pretty basic units. Um, you know, we're mindful that there's not as much storage as we'd like. Um, one thing that we did try to do, um, for example, what I'll show you here, you know, in a typical studio, this right here would be our clothes closet, really tight. Um, and then this here is actually millwork. So this is a sort of a cabinet closet that the resident can then choose to use either as a food pantry or as more of like a coat and broom closet or you know whatever they'd like. So we're trying to offer a little bit of flexibility there. Um, but storage, storage is a concern. Um, I'm going to move down. So I just have sort of a laundry list of things that we have done. Um, uh, you know, specifically uh, with the senior population in mind. So, you know, clearly starting at the beginning, um, you know, it's very important to have a very well lit um, and accessible building entry. Um, so we have some extra handrails, um, and then we were mindful of the of the concrete finish. Um, we wanted to make sure that we that we didn't have any slippery ramps or slippery stairs. So we're going with a rough concrete finish. Um, to ensure that, especially when it's damp, um, that people won't lose their footing. Um, we do have automatic entry doors. So at, at, all, at the exterior entry doors and at major points interior, you know, for example, into the common room, into the trash room, rooms that we expect people to use frequently, we have the automatic openers. Um, we also have key fob entry. We're not doing key codes or anything like that. Um, we don't want to rely on memorizing codes and, and, and that type of thing. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, a furnished lobby, um, just trying to create spaces for people to gather. Um, that's a big part of, of meeting the, the need for um, sort of seniors battling isolation, building community, et cetera. Um, centrally located elevator bank. It's very equitable for everybody in the building. They have to basically travel the same distance to get there. Um, Another thing we've done differently here, we have handrails installed in all corridors and common areas. That's not something we would typically do in a non-senior building. Um, we also are using a unique accent color for each floor of the building, um, such that you know if you get off the elevator on the wrong floor, hopefully there's sort of a signifier. You're like, okay, I'm on the purple floor. This is the red floor. This doesn't feel right. And wherever you are in the corridor, you'll have a line of sight to an accent wall that denotes, denotes what floor you're on. We're also using um, large font um, and large colorful signage that's sort of coordinated with those accent colors for our wayfinding. Um, we, are, oops, sorry. we are using um, LVT flooring throughout. Um, which is actually essentially the best flooring you can use for this population. It has sort of the, the best combination of minimizing trip hazard. Um, it works well with wheelchairs and walkers, um, and it has uh, a pretty good glare rating and that it's not, it's not creating a lot of glare. Um, so we have LDT flooring throughout. We do have polished concrete on the ground level, which actually offers a lot of the same stuff, less the glare, the polished concrete. Obviously not good for Claire. But, um, and then we have LED lighting throughout, making sure that all the spaces are bright and well lit um, for the senior population as well. Um, these are sort of the building wide things that we've done. Um, in terms of the units, um, so like I said, our, our split is 90 studios, 28 one bedrooms. Um, we more than doubled the number of code required type A units being mindful of the population. In our type B units, we've actually gone ahead and installed blocking in the walls in the bathrooms such that any resident, if they decide that they'd like to have extra grab bars, um, we can go ahead and install those as a, as a reasonable accommodation. Um, and interestingly, in some of our community engagement, um, one of the questions we were chewing on is, well, should we just go ahead and mount the grab bars in every unit? 
And we actually got a little bit of pushback on that and that there were a lot of people that said, hey, we don't necessarily wanna feel like we're living in an assisted living facility quite yet. So until we need it, let's not necessarily go there. I just want a regular apartment for now. Um, but we're, read, we're, we're poised and ready as needed. Um, the uh, living areas in the units also have LVT, and then we have sheet vinyl in the bathrooms, which are good for, for slip protection. Um, we are using sliding barn doors with a special loop handle um, for the interior doors within the units. Um, that obviously creates a little bit more space in what is a very tight unit. Um, but especially getting in and out of the bathroom, it eliminates the need to work around door swing, which can be a major issue if you're uh, mobility impaired. So um, we decided to go with the sliding barn doors and we, we got the thumbs up from our property management department that they can, they can work with those better than pocket doors. Um, we have a curved code base. Um, uh, around all the flooring. So there's not a 90 degree corner that people have to try and clean. That's good for, for maintenance and cleaning. Um, and then we also made sure that the color contrast. So when we were selecting our flooring colors, our cabinetry colors, our countertops and our wall colors, we make sure that there's a sufficient contrast between all of those. And apparently that's important in a senior unit to try to avoid any disorientation, whereas the floor and the wall might kind of blend together sometimes, um, especially if you have bright lighting. So we try to make sure that all those things are, are distinctly different. In addition, um, we, so, and you know, I think a lot of us in the affordable housing space you know, I think we take some of this for granted, but a lot of elements of universal de design are already baked into this. You know, we're, we're using the 2010 ADA and the ANSI standards here. And so, you know, all of our door handles, you know, faucets and fixtures, light switches, et cetera, are all designed, um, you know, under the principles of, of universal design, or I should say selected. So basically the idea is that you can operate any of those things with like a closed fist. You don't have to grab, you don't have to twist and turn, et cetera. Um, so that's essentially baked into to what we do in all of our properties at this point, but it is particularly salient with the senior population. Um, all of our appliances are ADA compliant. Um, we have the range controls on the front instead of on the back of the unit. So nobody has to reach over their frying pan or their pot of boiling water to adjust the temperature. Um, one thing we're, we're proud of, we, we made the decision before it was a code requirement to install the dedicated outdoor air system, ERV system in these units. And that decision was actually made, um, I think sometime around Labor Day 2020, when we were experiencing some of the worst wildfire smoke in a long time. Um, and we said, you know, for this population in particular, we really need to be focused on, on trying to create the healthiest possible indoor air environment. So we went ahead and decided to install those. Um, the units that we're installing can accommodate up to MERV 13 filter, um, which takes care of most particulates. Unclear really how those perform in a really bad wildfire smoke um, situation, might need to get a little bit higher up, but even still we're doing our best within sort of the, the means and the budget we have to try to create the best possible indoor air environment. Um, we also decided to install ceiling fans in all of our units. You know, we do not install air conditioning. The heat is radiant cove heat. Um, we don't install air conditioning. However, we use a VPI window and VPI actually has uh, sort of a, a custom template sort of in like attachment thing that you can install in the window depending on the type of freestanding air conditioning unit that the tenant might wanna provide. Um, such that they can get their hose in. Some of them take two hoses, some of them it's just one. Anyhow, community routes will provide that attachment as a reasonable accommodation such that if a, if a tenant did wanna bring an air conditioner into their unit, we could make it work for them. Um, and we also have power adapters in those locations as well. Um, we decided to install a 16 inch comfort height ADA toilet um, backed by popular demand. Um, just a lot, lot more safe, a lot more comfortable. Um, and then one just kind of final interesting thing, um, something we heard in our community feedback, um, residents said that they didn't like the idea of walking down 
sort of a nondescript hallway and seeing every unit door look exactly the same. And so we actually spec'd doors. Each one of them has a unique wood grain pattern on them, um, such that residents have a sense that, that that's their door. Um, looks a little bit different than the next one. And we're considering opportunities for them to sort of enhance their entryway as well. You know, what can they put on and around their door to sort of create their own custom little micro stoop? Um, so, you know, that's something that we'll be working on with, you know, Stephen's group and sort of the, the resident committees once they're in there and formed. Um, so back to Stephen. Looks like I'm up. Good. Thanks, Mason. I learned a lot. I had forgotten about some of those those uh, special little features you put in there. So very nice. Uh, so Jeff Pride has been, like I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, in my mind, we have kind of two pillars of, of programming. We have our training department, which goes out and trains senior centers and other healthcare providers and housing providers on LGBTQ awareness. Uh, and education. And then we also have kind of our, our senior center uh, column of, of, of activities. Um, now, as some of you know, in the senior center uh, models, there are some typical pieces that you have to reach, you know, the socialization, uh, recreational opportunities, educational opportunities, nutritional opportunities, uh, case management, social work, that sort of thing. And these are all kind of standard in, in any senior center. So we're offering all those. Um, we have a, a full-time social worker on staff right now that she uh, works with some of the hardest cases of, of, of people's, um, uh, of people's um, uh, difficulties that they're having. So we, we offer um, uh, coaching and, and assistance on re resources, finding resources, and just have an ear to kind of listen to you and, and follow your case for a while. Um, we also have a, um, uh, a new program we're piloting called um, uh, Do More, Feel Better. Uh, now, this is a pilot program coming out of the University of Washington that has to deal with early onset kind of depression in people. So if you are kind of starting to feel down and it's kind of lingering, you can talk to one of our, our volunteers or our case managers, and they have a system of, of kind of low barrier ways to kind of identify some of the things that you're doing during the day that maybe aren't bringing you the joy that you want, you know, and really kind of working through kind of creating a better schedule of events and things um, for your day just to kind of alleviate some of that early depression uh, before it gets to be too overwhelming. Um, one of the parts of the Gen Pride uh, Center that I'm especially proud of is our community gathering space, um, which will have uh, a full on commercial kitchen. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to providing low cost uh, meals at the center, um, five, probably five days a week. We'll probably serve up to 600 meals a week there when we're fully operational. Um, and then we'll have, you know, this commercial kitchen for other kinds of community events. You know, we have a lot of multicultural meal sharing opportunities that we can do with our partners. And so it'll be a very active area for um, people to come and gather and eat and have a meal together. Um, and then in the off meal times, the, the room itself will uh, divide into two separate areas, two, room, two soundproof rooms where we can do yoga classes. Um, part of our outreach right now is we do a lot of virtual online uh, yoga classes and Tai Chi classes and Qigong classes and watching movies. All of that eventually will come back into the space where we can do these kind of things um, both uh, online and on site. Um, and the, there's also will be a fair amount of just community meeting and event space. So the, the community gathering space itself will be available to our community partners to, to use or rent for different events. Um, we also have a, a community uh, conference room that's accessible um, from the outside. Yeah, thanks Mason. Here's the, this is a floor plan of, of the Gen Pride space kind of color coded. So you can see this health services center right here is one of the huts up front right on Broadway. Um, this yellow area here is the community meeting space. You can see there's a this accordion door that goes across here to close off the two spaces. Um, the garage door that Mason was referring to earlier is, is spans across here that can open out into the courtyard. Uh, purple back here is the commercial kitchen and walk-in refrigerators. Uh, the blue area is all of the staff and volunteer offices um, and break rooms and uh, meeting spaces. And then the green space there is the community conference room 
which will be um, fully accessible after hours so people can get into the building and, and have their community meetings in this conference room um, without having to get into the entire offices of Gen Pride. So that was designed in such a way to do that. Um, I do want to say one thing about our, our health services. One of these things that we're trying to put together is, um, is creating a, a, a place for people in the building and just in King County in general to come in and, and be kind of regularly checked in with a nurse. So we're going to have a visiting nurse model. Um, we're hoping to have a three to five day full-time nurse there that will be on site. We'll be able to kind of track people's um, different health issues they have, do referrals, do things like foot care. Um, we're also going to partner with an organization to provide behavioral health services and addiction services. So Gay City um, and POCAN are going to be there to provide uh, both um, addiction services uh, and prep uh, 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 prep treatment for to avoid HIV and also um, just kind of safer sex kind of stuff. So we're, we'll have a center that'll be working on that because you know older people have sex still. You know, so we're not we're not we're not we're not dead yet. You know, um, so we're going to be uh, that cent that center is still in formation. We're, we'll be uh, putting together a, a small committee, a board committee, uh, during this year to kind of really dig into what we want to have so we can send our RFPs. We've got a number of partners who express interest. Um, Country Doctor has expressed interest, Kaiser, Swedish, uh, the PACE program at Providence. Um, and we're also looking at kind of replacing, we, we were gonna use uh, Seattle Counseling Services as our behavioral health, but they're, they're no longer, they closed down recently. So we're looking for another behavioral health thing, but the whole thing will be centered based on this full-time nurse. That'll be kind of, the, kind of the, the, the gatekeeper there for all the kinds of things that will be um, coming up for health for health things for folks. Um, and uh, the next slide shows you kind of a rendition of how the community gathering space might look. So this is um, looking out towards Broadway. You can see this garage door here will be able to open up. This sliding doors here will go across here and we'll create a, uh, a soundproof uh, space for the two rooms. And then where the where you see the point of view is that's where the commercial kitchen will be. So the commercial kitchen is, is kind of behind this, this uh, screen here. Um, but it'll be a, a great space just to drop in, to have coffee, to meet people, uh, and, to, um, and to do different kind of program offerings that we'll have there every day. And Mason, I think the next slide is kind of about the actual site itself. So there you go. Yeah, just threw in a couple, a couple drone pictures. Um, so this is a few months ago when we just started demo and excavation. Um, you can see we've preserved the husks of, of the huts and we need to rebuild that port cochere. Um, but um, as some of you might, may surmise, um, this uh, remained an open dirt pit for a few months longer than we would have hoped because of a, of a work stoppage. Um, but we're making good progress. Um, this was taken last week. So um, we're at about 25% completion. Um, we're about a week out from having our slab on grade poured. Um, and we have our first vertical elements, which is exciting. So we're, we're back on track. And as of now, the expected completion date is August 9th, 2023. So that's what we got. And happy to take any questions or comments or thoughts or criticisms. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> I, I was surprised by the decision to have bathtubs because we usually in senior population properties you don't they don't do bathtubs because of concern about falls. So I thought that was interesting that you chose to, chosen to do bathtubs. Yeah, that was something that we did here. There was there was a lot of people that that did want them. Um, so yeah. Mason, you mentioned the um, to the Eldridge piece, and I didn't realize it was a Texaco station. Was there a lot of um, like environmental stuff that needed to be done uh, around that, or was it old enough that that had already been kind of done before? Very good question. Um, we actually had a clean phase two, um, which was surprising. Um, 
we did encounter some stinky dirt um, when we were when we were boring our our piles. So um, fortunately, it was very limited, um, and we you know we obviously brought in our environmental consulting. We did testing. Um, we did not the the levels found did not trigger a need um, to do a whole lot of remediation or mitigation. We didn't have to over excavate. Um, we did obviously contain and dispose of that those soils appropriately, and we did decide to install what's called a vapor mitigation system, which is sort of a passive system to make sure that any any dirt that we did not discover that may still be under there, that it's not that there aren't any potentially harmful fumes that are coming up into the building. So we have a system that would capture and then route those fumes away from away from the residents. But honestly, we it, it could have been worse. We expected it to be worse. Um, and we feel we feel pretty fortunate. Yeah. Is stinky dirt is that like a technical term? <laughs> you know, for all intents and purposes, yes, Stephen. That's really, really okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Learn something every day. It strikes fear into the heart of any developer. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Stephen, for the the clinic portion, it sounds like you've thought of a potential pace model through Providence. Have you also thought about adult day, maybe an adult day center? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, that that space there that's up front is about what. It's under 500 square feet, I believe. Um, so it's not going to be that accommodating for that many people at, all at once. That's kind of what the community gathering space is for. So, you know, the adult day center model, if I if I, if I understand, um, Alyssa, is kind of a, a place for people just to kind of um, that are needing some some socialization and some kind of communication with folks. They 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 go to those facilities to kind of spend the day, right? Is that kind of what those are? Four hour blocks. Uh, Adult Day Health, though, integrates skilled nursing, um, like a nursing component of it, which is kind I of see. It's I similar see. to PACE in that sense um, and can do occupational and physical therapy as well. I see. There will be a clinic room for that sort of thing, but I, I think it's going to be somewhat limited. So. Yeah. Stephen, I was really, uh, and Mason to some extent too, fascinated by the decision to integrate the Gen Pride space so much with the, the residential space of the building. Um, at Plymouth, more in the PSH world, we keep them very, very separate, even mm -hmm. when the community, when the uh, commercial space is sort of serving the same population as lives in the building. Mm -hmm. So I was curious about the thought process behind that, the benefit to both the, the broader community and the community in the building, and maybe some of the pros and cons you thought of in making that decision. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, okay, we what we did is, you know, I, I believe that you know part of the part of the reason why this the senior center model was kind of selected to, to have a, a, a service center on the ground floor was because you know we not only had kind of historical trauma from LGBTQ elders around moving into these places. Um, but we also had this big affirmative marketing that we had to do. And that's that's an ongoing thing. That's not just a one-time kind of a project. And I think we felt um, as a team, if we were to have um, kind of a, an LGBTQ organization on the ground floor partnering with community roots housing, we'd have a better chance of making people feel welcome and inclusive there and have a, they'd have a voice that um, was someone who they're familiar with and they trust. Uh, I think some of the downsides are, in my mind, are people feeling like the center is just for the people that live there. Um, and, and that's one thing we're going to have to really work on around marketing is to make sure that, you know, this is a facility for all residents of King County, uh, both to, you know, to live in the apartments and also to take advantage of the Gen Pride space. Uh, but I, I do think, though, you know, given, I mean, the more and more I get into this project and you know, like Mason said, we've been kind of living and breathing this for about the last four years. And it, it really makes more and more sense to us that we have the service provider there because partly what our aim is for this building is, you know, this isn't is an assisted living facility. It's, a, it's to help people age in place longer. And we feel as though having services right there at the center will establish, you know, kind of firmer relationships with case managers and other folks to kind of keep people stable in their in their housing longer. So that's kind of the was kind of the driving force, I believe, behind um, partnering with with an LGBTQ organization. Uh, Mason, do you have anything to that? 
No, no, I, th I think you got it. I mean, you know, from, I guess from our, you know, my, my developer perspective, you know, we do have the separation in that Gen Pride is its own condo. You know, we, we are tied through the condo association. Um, but I mean, it's really been such an integrated process from the start. I mean, the partnership is, it's really um, familiar and, and comfortable. And, you know, Stephen and I work very closely on the design of the space. We work very closely on thinking about programs and services and how both the residential project and the Gym Pride project sort of interface with the community. And so I think almost the nature of our relationship blends into the design of the building as well. And additionally, um, Katie, what, what Gen, the Gen Pride board is doing is, you know, as we anticipated this outreach to our community about the, about the building, um, and also trying to create the diversity in the building that, we're, that we desire. Um, we felt as though we had to start building some key relationships with BIPOC organizations and others that are that we can start, they can have a relationship of trust. Um, and so what we're doing, um, we, in fact, our, our most recent event, uh, the Pillars of Pride was our initial launching pad for establishing relationships with other organizations to honor their seniors, they were able to kind of select and nominate anyone that they felt was was um, was uh, was desire, desiring of a of a of a nomination, uh, and you know as we move into the building itself, um, we've also are right now in this summer we're recruiting a, a community advisory board or group, and this is a, a community advisory a board level committee that will serve as a conduit uh, both between. Uh, the community and what, I mean, they're, they're really charged with two things. You know, one is to help us get the marketing, the front of marketing out to their communities and to, and to bring them into the, into this project. The other thing, the ongoing thing is to, is to um, survey and talk to community members about the kinds of relevant programming and services that they want. You know, Gen Pride, you know, we're mostly a white led organization, uh, at least right now we're looking to change that. Um, but as we as we recognize our own limitations on what we know about different kinds of populations and different diverse groups, we wanted to have a conduit of a conversation and a, a way to um, to reach out to community in a way that was that was genuine and would give us the kind of information that we need to make sure that we're providing the kinds of things people want to do. You know, I mean, there's a lot of common things that folks want to do together, but like the multicultural meal program, I think is a is a key is a key component of that. You know, we want to really make sure that we've got um, our a lens on our entire community and not just not just one part of it. I just want to say I'm just I'm pretty floored by the extent to which you all have been so thoughtful and intentional in all of the community um, stakeholder engagement you've done to serve the population, just like blown away. And as a member of the queer community too, I just wanna thank you. Thanks, Danny. Yeah. And just if anyone is curious, because it's on my mind all the time, is um, the space is, uh, is essentially a $4.3 million uh, space that Gen Pride is raising money. Um, we are, uh, right now we have a $5 million capital campaign the extra seven hundred thousand dollars is uh, going to go into a transitional budget, so that we can actually staff and do a bigger mission that we'll have at this at this new space. Um, but essentially, we we've raised about almost three point four million dollars of that of that goal, and so we are still looking to partner both with um, individuals um, that have access to resources and other foundations to help us get the rest of the way. So, anyone who's got any leads on that, I'm all ears. I tell people I will come to an opening of an envelope to talk about this project. So, you know, you just got to call me. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions or comments? I do have one more. Um, in terms of operations long term, um, knowing that you're up against fair housing law and you know, trying to do, I, I love how much effort is going into the affirmative marketing plan. Plymouth has a very sort of similar situation where we have a population we're trying to serve, but can't limit to. Yeah. And um, I wish we'd done more of what you've done. Um, 
long term, assuming that there, there do end up being some folks in the building who are not members of the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. how do you how do you deal with that and, and make sure that the, the building is still affirming to, to this community when, when you can't limit it exactly? Well, you know, the when you look at the alphabet soup of LGBTQIA plus, in my mind, the A stands for kind of a couple words. One is uh, asexual folks. Another is uh, our allies. And so, you know, is, is we feel as though to have this building called Pride Place, to have a gay center on the ground floor, we are putting out a pretty strong signal that this is a, is a welcoming community for everyone and not just the LGBTQ folks, but you've got to kind of, you know, I mean, no one's going to move into a building like that if they're like, homophobic, I doubt, you know, so we feel as though that's kind of limiting some of our, our straight allies to people who are at least, um, you know, uh, comfortable with our community. And we have no intention of, of um, not providing the same kinds of services to straight folks as we do to gay folks. Um, that's just not in, in, our, in our nature as an organization. Um, we do feel as though a lot of the program will be will preference the LGBTQ community, but you know some of those things are the same for everyone. I mean, if you you go to yoga class, you know you go to yoga class. It's not doesn't care w- what your orientation or gender is, you know. Um, so there's the movie nights we're going to be doing, the dinners, all those sorts of things are really going to be open to anybody. Um, but we do feel as though having kind of our 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 banner uh, Pride Place and Gen Pride on the building, we we hope to send a pretty clear signal what the purpose of the building and, and, the, and the main population that lives there is about. And just for you alliteration fans, pride place between pike and pine. How about that? <laughs> That's gonna be our, our tagline, I think, at some point. I'm just too curious to go to um, following up on Katie's question. When folks apply for housing, it's my understanding that you can't turn, you can't really, you have to accept the first person that applies, right? If they're eligible. Yeah. And so I'm just curious about that. And what, you know, just with respect to, to, to straight folks who maybe are not allies, right? So yeah. do you have like a, a conversation? I don't know if your application has some piece that's sort of more informative for them. So they're super clear about the population that they'll be spending time with. They don't, if they don't get it already or an interview, but you can't really decline them on, like, I'm just curious about that. Well, I, I, I think Mason got something to say. I'll, I'll just, I'll just say what's on my mind about that. I, I think probably what Jen Pride and Community Housing is going to be doing uh, beginning uh, right at beginning of 2023 is we're going to be spending the first three to six months kind of advertising this to our community about this prospect. We're going to be holding workshops about how you're pull what kind of financial documents that you need. We want to get people really kind of quali- pre-qualified prior to them actually applying so that we can really make sure that we've got enough spaces. But, but you're right, Danny, it, it is a first come first serve basis. Uh, and I don't believe, Mason, maybe you can clarify, I don't think there's anything in the application that was going to, it's going to make that kind of a statement. Um, really, our best, yeah, our best uh, uh, strategy in my mind is, is just public relations, you know, really getting the word out there long in advance. And so, and then, you know, Commuters Housing will, will let us know this is the date that we're going to be opening up the, 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 uh, you know, the, the application process and our community will kind of be first, be first informed about that. Um, but even long-term, you know, it, it's going to be, I think that, um, I think that they, um, community housing has had experience like at the Liberty bank building, which is an African-American building. Uh, I think they're like 86 some percent, um, that they were able to get, uh, African-American folks in there, but it's, 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 you know, the maintenance of that over, over longer term is going to require kind of an ongoing awareness of the building. And that's kind of where I think this Gen Pride um, relationship is, is also kind of key to that. Because I, I think most developers say that number kind of starts to dwindle away after a while. Um, uh, but since we'll have a very active program on the ground floor, we think it'll, it'll help with that. Thanks. Yeah, it sounds tricky, but a tricky. doable. Yeah. <laughs> tricky, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Exciting. 
Well, Thanks, Mason Mike. and Stephen, thank you both so much for joining us. That was a really, truly wonderful presentation and overview, and I think really hit on kind of everyone's uh, unique interests that uh, called in today. So we really, really, really appreciate your time. Sure. Yeah. And this was recorded, which is great. So others who yeah, uh, intended to be here. Yeah, so it's recorded. Um, I'm going to send it out directly to a few folks, but then it'll also be posted on our YouTube channel. So um, oh, great. Any, anyone can go and access it. And um, we get a lot of subscribers that way. too. Oh, cool. That's great. Yeah. Great. Thank nice. you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. OK. Bye. Bye bye. bye. That went a while. <laughs>